Welcome back to AM Northwest. Our next guest went from climbing the corporate ladder to climbing the world's highest mountains. She became the first American wo- first woman and the first British woman to successfully summit K2. We welcome the author to the greatest heights facing danger, finding humility, and climbing a mountain of truth, Vanessa O'Brien. Good morning, Vanessa. Hi, good morning. How are you? Good. I want to get your story, and let's start at the beginning, really. You were raised by uh, young parents who liked adventure, and you kind of got caught up in that as well, right? That's right. Uh, I had very, very young parents, and so it's uh, sort of a, it's like the Griswolds. We were thrown <laughs> in the back of the car and, you know, taken on holiday every, uh, you know, every year to visit a different state and uh you know probably my sense of adventure started there um and if you wanted to spend time with your dad it was doing what dad liked which was uh ice fishing and hunting and and things like that so um of course you couldn't talk during those things because uh you'd scare you know the fish or stuff like that so it was a it's kind of funny and it's mentioned in the book that's so great um then you climb the corporate ladder um, and did really well financially, but then 2008 hit. Yeah, that's right. And that was a, a big turning point because uh, it was something that that really was a global event. It affected lots of uh, different people, lots of different countries, uh, whether it was Main Street or High Street. And uh, it was a turning point where I ended up with my husband in Hong Kong of all places, uh, wondering what I'm doing there. And the first time really without a job since probably 15 years old with my first babysitting job and paper route and everything else. So uh, it was sort of a um, a crisis for a type A person not having anything to do. Um, and that's when I was inspired probably by the large buildings looking around and walking around and thinking, okay, what's next? Because I can't really sit home and do nothing. And in your book, you say that a friend suggested, why don't you climb a mountain? Yeah, you know, I was looking at so many different options and I had a list of things to do or at least a list of criteria of things to do. And I would check things off the list, but some things you know, might seem altruistic, like, hey, you know, we all want to cure malaria, but is that really best or is it best left for somebody like Bill Gates, right? Right. Um, And then there's, you know, things that you might like. I I love uh, skincare, for example, but, and there's some great antioxidants and, and unique fruits in Asia, but you get into the product packaging and shelf lives and, you know, how long these things last. And, and maybe that's longer and, and more complicated than, you know, what I thought was a th- three-year project. But then when somebody said uh, Everest, it was like, wow, Everest, Everest, Everest. It just echoed. And I thought, okay, it had been climbed then in 1953, but it was also being climbed now. The question was, could I do it? Even though I didn't have any climbing skills, I thought climbing was um, a skill that could be learned and therefore taught. So that's how I approached it. And you really did approach it in a way you uh, watched every DVD that you could. You trained really hard. Um, I thought it was really interesting is that the challenge is really a mental challenge. Yeah, it's much more mental than people think because uh, these, uh, if you're on a high mountain, which are, they're really all in Asia, the all peaks over 7,000 meters, 8,000 meters, um, they're all in Asia. So if the first like 110 mountains, if you count down from one to 110 are all in Asia, uh, these, these uh, sort of big mountains takes anywhere from six to eight weeks to climb because the body has to acclimatize. It's a bit like going underwater where you have to, you know, get used to the pressure. Right. Um, but you have to do it in, in the reverse going up. So you can't just climb really quick, really high, or you get sick, uh, you know, acute mountain sickness. There's other terms for it, AMS. So you really have to take your time. The body is really smart. It naturally builds red blood cells, which are thick in oxygen. So it's helping you adjust to that, but it takes time. So you have to climb high, sleep low in this sort of repetitive process. And uh, it helps you in that, in that Um so that part's good. But yeah, it, it does take time and uh, you learn in that process as well. You know, But the mental part comes because it takes time. So if it was a, a quick process, I think uh, you know people could go in and get out. But because it takes time, the mental process has to keep you there and you have to keep your mind focused. And that's what um, can, can psych a lot of people out because they can uh, let that 
time and empty space uh, in their minds, let other things come in. And fear is a big uh, uh, proponent of that. It likes to take empty space and uh, create imaginary uh, things in that empty space. Oh, I bet. Um, so you reach the top of K2. What's the feeling you have? So on K2, it took three years to get to the top, which was uh, a big surprise because, you know, I had climbed, uh, let's say, five peaks over 26,000 feet, all the seven summits, the highest peak on every continent. And here comes K2, the second highest mountain in the world. And it's not letting me to the summit. And I'm a little baffled by this, right? Um, you know, year one goes by, we get to camp uh, two. Year two goes by, we get to camp three, but there's an avalanche that takes out everything at camp three. So every year I'm getting to camp higher, so there's hope, um, which is, uh, you know, an interesting uh, perspective. You know, you're getting data and information, but there's no guarantee of a summit on K2. And every year it's, it's uh, like a 40% roll of the dice of whether people will summit or not summit. So that third year, you know, we were really uh, fortunate to be the only team to summit. And when we got up there, it was uh, a really unique experience because <clears throat> initially we were climbing in really, really bad weather. And I always say, uh, you know, there, what is above knows what's below, but what is below does not know what is above. Oh. So in a, in a poetic way, if you can get through some of these really bad weather um, you know, uh, bits around the mountain, you could be rewarded with a lovely summit, but you'll never know until you get there because every 300 meters or a thousand feet, it's almost like Dante's Inferno, right? You have to, you have to almost earn yourself the next passage, if you will, but you never know what's above you. And that's how quickly the weather can change on some of these mountains. Um, and why we can only climb during certain parts of the year, because if you climb at the wrong time, the jet streams are up there. This is these peaks really hit the bottom of the troposphere where all weather takes place. Planes fly and the jet stream can be 200 miles an hour. So you cannot climb in the wrong season. Wow. You know what? There is so much to get to, but I want to tell our viewers that you have a book event tonight at five o'clock, Powell City of Books. You can register online. It's free, but you can register online. We'll put all that information for everyone on our website at katu.com. We barely touched, scratched the surface of this. Um, it's fascinating. Your all your challenges, your struggles, all of that. It's just incredible. And by the way, it's super dangerous to do. So more power to you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Great to meet you. Great. Welcome back to AM Northwest. It's a true rags to riches story of a Holocaust survivor like no other. You likely haven't heard of Siggy Wilzig, but his journey from